So we're going to create a variable that contains our name. Or whatever. A is equal to Bobby. Now a string is actually a list of characters. You know, it's got a B and an O and a B and a B and a Y in there. We can pull those out individually like this. What is the character at position 0? It's a B. What is the character at position 1? It's a note. Yeah, so we can guess what the character position 2 would be. And the character position 3. And the character position 4. So how long is this string? Well, it's five characters long. We can figure that out by typing L-E-N of A. So Bobby, my string is five characters long. Whatever name you put in yours, that's how long it is. So if this position is zero, then what's the position of the Y? Snap judgment, five. Well, the snap judgment's wrong. It's four, because zero, one, two, three, four. So you cannot access A parentheses or square brackets five in a given error on mine or whatever the length of yours is. You know, if yours is 10 characters long, it says index out of range. So this number here, inside the square brackets, is the index. Index 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. A shortcut and this only works in this language. I don't know of any, uh, any other languages that does that. If you want the Y, rather than figure out the length and subtract 1, which is a valid way of doing it, you can just say negative 1, and negative 2, and negative 3, and negative 4, and negative 5. So, A, parentheses, negative 1, is the last character. Negative 2 would be a B, negative B, 3 would be a B, and so on. So you could start either from the beginning or the end if you want. Normally you start from the beginning, you know. <laughs> I am sorry, which one of Let's find out. Um, here we go. We, if we do A negative 2, it goes to that one. A negative 3 would be that one. A negative 4 would be that one. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. So a string is a list of characters. It's a very specialized list. It's actually stored in a separate class called string. You can access each element of the list with its index number. So a sub x, where x is the index number where x equals, starts with 0, and goes up to len minus 1, you know. Bobby's 5, so we can go 0 through 4. If you make x the index number negative, it starts counting from the end. There's more than one kind of list. You can have lists of numbers. I'm going to start my shell again. So it's up at the top of the screen. So P for a phone number. Now we have to start a list that's not a string with the square braces. And then you put stuff in there separated by commas. So my phone number might be 4, 0, 5, 8, 9, 8, 7. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit long. But there we go, we have a list. If we type print P, it prints the list. 
It's not a string, so it didn't squish it all together in a nice little format, but it's a list. Meaning that we can get the first digit out, the second digit out, and so on. So as a shortcut for saying P square bracket zero, N square bracket, sometimes I'll call it index, sometimes I'll call it subscript. I've just been trained from several different textbooks. So P at index zero would be a four. P at index negative one is going to be a seven. P at index negative two is going to be a six. P of index one is going to be a zero. So if I want that one, what is that one's index number? Not doing it negative style. Yeah, that's a three, right. So P subscript three. There we go. And so on. You can make a loop that'll count through those things. Now, if we're going to start making loops, we actually ought to do this in a script rather than in, so if we make any mistakes, we can correct them. So I'm going to do new file. Save as. And call this one list one. First time we've hit lists. I'm going to make a list, except I'm not, not going to make it that long. My phone number is 73715567. Now we talked about how you can use a for loop to step through a list. A for loop will go through a range like this. Remember we did this for x in range 10. You don't have to type that. I'm going to comment it out. That'll count, you know, 0 through 9. Or we can do for x in range. Nope, we're not going to do a range. For x in that list. For x in p. Print x. Let's run it. And it should have printed out every number, every digit. And you could do that with any kind of list, not just numbers. And just like I've said, looping is what computers or programming is all about, so are lists. In other languages, they're known as arrays. Why do I say that? Well, if you have, you know, 120 characters running around in a, you know, multiplayer game, you know, you're playing Warcraft or whatever, you got a lot of characters on the screen. You can be sure that somewhere in the computer, in the server, they're all being saved as a list. And it's stepping through the list to determine which ones of them are close enough for you to see. You know, or where their positions are so they, they can be drawn, you know, on the screen. Lists are stuff like, you know, census data. There's all sorts of things that are lists. You know, if you pull out your phone, you're going to see lots of different lists, even if you're not thinking of it in that fashion. For example, your phone book, your contacts. That's a list. What else? What else do you use your phone for? Your apps. Yeah, your apps. all your apps. All your apps are stored in an internal list. Your music files, your MP3s, stuff like that. Those are lists. If you do search, you know, and, you, and you're searching for your favorite Lady Gaga song, then when you type in Gaga, it uh, sorts through the list. Well, it doesn't sort through the list. It steps through the list, finding all of those that match that name so that it can display just that subset of the list. So that's one way to step through the list. That's the easiest way. I'm going to show you a longer way. And you're going to go, well, why would I want to use a longer way? Because doing it this way does not let us change the values in list, even if I think they could. I'm going to show you. You don't necessarily have to type this because it's not going to work. But if I try to set everything in the list equal to zero, and then I try to print it out afterwards, it's not going to work. You might think that it would. Actually, you're thinking, I would never would have thought of that. But there we go. It, it left it the same. And the reason why is that this X is just a copy of what was in the list. 
And so even if you change it, it doesn't change the original list. It's like you have a guy in an art gallery and he's just taking pictures of all the paintings. And yeah, later on he can go and Photoshop his own face into all the pictures, but it doesn't change the original paintings. Wouldn't it be illegal if you're in a museum and taking pictures of paintings just to make them off as your own? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but they do allow photograph taking at, at museums. They they may not allow you to uh, come in with you know giant professional cameras the size of. <laughs> okay, anyways, so you can't change the data that way. You can't change the elements that way. So that is why there's an alternate form of iterating through a list or traversing the list. I forget which uh, one the book calls uh, our textbook. Traversing the list with a for loop. Traversing the list with a for loop. Also known as iterating through the list. Stepping through it. All sorts of euphemisms. Here's how you do it with a while loop. To do a while loop, if you remember, you don't necessarily have to type this part, but we had several more steps than we did with a for. You have the first step. I'll just go ahead and type it over here. So to do a while loop, you have to initialize. And then you can do your while. And then you can do something good with that value. And then you update your counter. That's generally how you do it. Initialize your counter, you have your while, you do something good, and then you update that counter. Whereas a for loop is usually just two steps, conceptually. The for statement and then the do something good. So we're going to need a counter here to, to be our index value. And I'm not going to call it i m x because I'm going to try not to use the same variable over and over and over. So let's call it i for iterator or c for counter, i for index. Okay, so I have to start it off at zero because that's position zero. And my while loop is going to be while it's less than the length of the list. So while i is less than the length of the list, forgot my colon, print it out, but I can't just print out i because that would print out 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. If I print out p, it's going to print out that entire list seven times in a row. So I need to say p at position i. Because that'll get the first character, and then it'll be the second character, and then it'll be the third one, and then it'll be the fourth one. Now I'm not done with my list yet. I have one my while. I have one more thing I need to do. What's that? I need to have the update the counter. Otherwise, it would never exit. So I have been writing it this way. I is equal to I plus one. I can shorten that. I think I've typed this a little bit, but I wasn't typing it recently. I could just put i plus equals 1. That means the same thing, and it's shorter. So again, you see that as far as the while loop goes, this follows this uh, pattern. Initialize your counter, have your while, you do something good, whatever it is, and then you update your counter. So it took four statements here to do what this one took in two. Is it easier to write four loops? Yeah, much easier. Is there any reason not to do this? Well, if you're going to be changing the data. If I wanted to wipe out the list as I went along, I could do that. We'll demonstrate that. Why would you want to do that? Well, sometimes you do want to change the items in the list. Okay, so it printed it out a second time, demonstrating that it actually works. But before that i is equal or plus equal to 1, I'm going to do this. p subscript i is equal to 0. And then after that, I'm going to print the list out, just like I did before. And this time, it will be all zeros when it's done. So that wiped it out. That's demonstrating that if you're actually going to change the values of the list, you cannot use a for loop like that in this particular language. You have to use a while loop. In other languages... I'm not going to even go there. Let's just stick with the idea that if you have a while loop where you're accessing it by a counter, you can change the data 
but if you're accessing it with something that's a copy of the original data, you can't change it. Okay, just to keep things clean, I'm actually going to delete that where we zeroed it out. That may be enough about lists at the moment. We'll, we'll come back to it. So, for loops are easier to write, but they do not allow you to change the values in the list. While loops take extra steps, but you can change the values if need be. All right, the reason we talked about lists as a preface for what we're going to get into is that we're going to write the application that's going to go out on the internet, pull a web page in, and then examine the data that's in the web page to pull out the price of the coffee that it displays. So when you're looking at a web page, I may have done this already, I, I do not recall. Come on. Let's find a really easy web page. I know one. Alrighty. This is a web page that has like very, very few elements. So, at, if you care, L U M L A N D, Lumland. View page source. This is a very short web page. Somewhere out on the server, there is either a text file that has this. Or there's a program that will generate all this stuff on the fly. And this is the HTML of the web page. And some of y'all have probably done a little bit of HTML editing and some have not. For example, there's an IMG. Yeah. This means um, go out and pull that image in, which seems not to actually be working because there's no logo up at the top. And then another IMG tag, everything that begins with an angle bracket is called a tag so there's a whole bunch of tags here and that includes text there's a P tag that stands for paragraph paragraph of text so what our program needs to do is it needs to read in all of the HTML of a web page and when it's done it's just going to be a string and we've seen that you can access every element in the string by its position. So it needs to be able to find like the dollar sign of a price and then pull in the next several digits that indicate the, you know, the price that that's indicating. Then it's going to have to do one more little trick, which is converting that string to a number. But we know how to do that. We would probably use the float command in order to do that. So if we go out the textbooks, we're going to hit the other one, the head first. It's a PDF. PDFs are far easier to view if you download them rather than if you look at them inside the little preview here. So I'm going to go ahead and click download, download it to disk. And then open it. You don't have to open it at all if you just want to type, but like I've said before, this is a good textbook. It's just, it doesn't really present things in a uh, 
logical, methodical order like I expect a textbook really should. Okay. So I have our PDF here. The, unfortunately, the authors of the textbook let their website lapse. They're, uh, you know, they're licensed for that domain name. But other people have created the same domain, so uh, we're going to have to substitute the correct one for this one. I'll go and find it a minute. In a minute. All righty, your new gig at Starbucks Coffee. Starbucks Coffee has made a name for itself as the fastest-growing coffee shop around. If you've seen one on your local corner, look across the street and you'll see another one. All right. We can see where this is going. The Starbucks CEO is always on the lookout for ways to improve profits. He's come up with a great idea. He wants a program that will show him the current price of coffee beans from a certain maker so that his buyers can make informed decisions about when to buy. I had a programmer do some work for me, but they're not answering their phone. They've disappeared. Can you take over? I'll let you have the code. Okay, so here's the current Starbucks code. Import, and then it's got an import library. This library is for making a request to the Internet. A URL stands for Uniform Resource Locator. It's the thing that starts with HTTP, which would be an annoying thing to have to type in in front of every web page. So nowadays, browsers just assume that you're going to type that. But I know that in days past, I'm sure you have typed in HTTP. And when we're issuing a command, we have to include it. There are other forms of internet traffic as well as HTTP, which stands for hypertext. <laughs> so, FTP is probably the other most uh, famous URL type. And FTP stands for File Transport Protocol, where you can log directly onto a machine's file system and upload files and download files. Maybe you've done that. Nowadays, you tend to just go to a website on a, on the server and find the link that says upload, like we do a D2L, and choose your file and do it that way. You know, in olden days, you might pop open. A lot of this stuff, you know, predates the visual web. FTP certainly does. So you would type FTP, and then you would give the server name, like that lumland.com. If I knew the password, I could type it in, and if I knew the, you know, whatever, then I could upload files to it, or I could download files. But we're going to do hypertext protocol, HTTP. Hypertext meaning that you have a page full of text. Not sure what I did there. And then um, it has links to other page fulls of text. And again, that predates the graphical web. The idea of hypertext really was pages of text, not with all these pictures and graphical widgets and stuff like that that we have on it. Okay, so we need to find a replacement for the Starbuzz. I know I've done this in the past, but let's see. Okay, great. There really are stores named Starbuzz now. That's not going to work. <laughs> Beans are us. Welcome to the Beans R Us pricing page. That will do. That looks like it's a copy of what the web page is. It looks like a very simple web page, but every time you refresh it, it prints out a, a, a random number. And that's because it's not a real company. It's just for this programming exercise. Okay, so that's going to be a long URL to type. I apologize for that. So I'm going to instead post it on our D2L page so that you can just copy and paste it. Okay, if you go back to our D2L page to our main page, to the news, you'll see a URL for Starbuzz. 
you click it, you can copy the URL, and you're going to paste it into our code at the point where it asks for us to. It looks like it was written in 1992. Yeah, yeah, it's it's meant to be that way because all it is is a is a programming assignment. Yeah. If uh, if you go to a real web page, it's chock full of uh, like if we went to Amazon. Any more web pages are incredibly complex and have acres and acres of code. View page source. Kind of like Quo Nelly. Back in the oldest days of the web, pages really did look like this. Well, not you know, only three lines of text. It's pretty boring. But, you know, they were very, very simple. They were non-interactive. They didn't have light-up arguments, you know, where, you know, things, you know, lit up as you moved your mouse over. Every single time you did something on a web page, it would have to go back to the, to the server and pull a new version in so you couldn't, like, you know, just click Add to Cart and have it keep you on the same page. It would load up another one. Maybe I'll remember the dark ages. So let's uh, follow along with what we were going to do. Here is our code. If you get desperate, some of the things in the uh, in the PDF are copy pasteable, but you ought to be able to type this, in my opinion. So let's open up a new file, call it Starbuzz. Starbuzz.py. And I need to try to get both pages on the internet at the same time. You're not so required. First we need the import that's going to bring in the library that allows Python to make requests to the internet. URL, L-I-B, two L's in a row, dot request, R-E-Q, E, yeah, R-E-Q, U-E-S-T, then page equals URL, L-I-B, dot request dot url open and then we need that url that i pasted into d2l that one and i'm going to assume you're going to copy it so i'm not going to type it i mean say it out loud so, I will go back out to D2L. I seem to have lost D2L. Here we are. Of course, home, grab the URL, copy it, or follow the link, and then copy the URL, however you like to do it. Paste it into your program. Okay. We're going to stop there and just do print page just to make sure we don't have any syntax errors. This ought to do something. Not going to do much, but it ought to do something. Okay. I didn't get a syntax error. It did print something. So I'm feeling good about that. If I'd left off a quote or misspelled something, you know, probably wouldn't have done that. However, that's not useful. It's just a link to the web page at this point. We need to get the text out of it. Getting the text out of it requires us to find our book URL. Here we go. Page.read.decode. Let's do that in a couple of steps, not the, not the uh, exact way they did it. So text is equal to page.read. And then instead of printing the page, let's print the text. Print text. A 
Okay, it's a short web page, and we do see most of it there. It's got some extra extra stuff on it, these Bs and things like that. So we're going to decode it from being this format to pure ASCII text. Or nowadays, as it's called on the internet, UTF text. And I don't even remember what UTF stands for. Universal text format. Could be. So uh, we're going to need one more command here. Which is text equals text dot decode. Let's try that. See if we can get away with not specifying the format. Yeah, that worked. What they really wanted us to put in there was quotes here and then put UTF-8. I assumed, apparently correctly, that if you didn't specify UTF-8, then uh, it would default to that anyways, because that is the format in which 99.9% .9 of English web pages anyways are sent in. code that changes the price every time is at this web page. It's a script that if we could view the script rather than the results, we would see that it's got some random number generator behind it. Most of the internet, I'm sorry. You're not going to be able to see that though. On right, the exactly. Right. We don't know what that's written in. It's probably not written on Python. It's server-side code. An awful lot of what you see on the internet is not a simple text file. It's a program that's spitting out this text for us, and so that program is gonna is what generates the random number. So we can't see it in this case. That makes sense. You can write server side code in all sorts of languages, in Python and in Java and PHP and all sorts of other scripting languages. And what we see is the end result. Some program on the server, when it gets a request, goes and it runs that program. But instead of printing it to a screen, it sends it back to us. And then our browser gets that and then converts it to a nice pretty page. Okay, I think this works. We see that the price is there. The only thing changing in this, each time we run the program, is that value. So it was 560, and then it was, you know, if I run it again, it'll be something else. Five fifty, and so on. Just like if I had the web page open itself and I kept hitting refresh, I'd see new, new values for it. Stop misclicking. So F5 for refresh, 643, 539, and so on. Now the textbook claims that it uh, updates itself once every five minutes, but really it's a random number every single time you load it up. And based on your question, I'm gonna see if I can find the code for the web page just for your curiosity because I'm curious now too what it's written in. Okay, so we've started, but what we really well, I'll just let the text read it to us in their silly way. Take a good look at the Starbucks code. What does it actually do? Well, we know what it does. The code you've been left goes to the prices page on Beans R Us, give you the current price of their coffee beans. But instead of giving just the cost, it gives you all of the HTML text. Hey, that's not right. I only need the price, not all that other stuff. Can you give me just the cost? So the cost is embedded in the HTML, the hypertext language. Take a closer look. We will see it there. It's got a dollar sign in front of it and 5.49, whatever. So it's in a string. That decode statement that we saw turns 
whatever it got from the internet into a string that we can parse, into an ASCII string that we can, uh, and when I say parse, but we can access it element by element in order to pull the value out that we want. So a string is a list of characters. We can find characters in the text by their offset. I was calling it index earlier. They want to call it an offset? Okay. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So to get this to work, we're going to need to know the offset of that 5.49. And we're going to do something dumb, I believe, in our first effort and just hard code the offset. Meaning like we're going to put in 231 or whatever that number is. And that's a bad idea because the web, change, the web page could change at any moment. Somebody could go in and decide that they're going to put a pretty picture up at the top and so they'd add some HTML code and then all of a sudden it's not at position 241 anymore. So this is a really bad way of doing it, but it, it's... We'll go with this. Ah, there was something I forgot to show you, which is not how to pull out a single character, but what's known as a slice. You know, there's several characters there. The price, if it never gets above $9, is a number, period, number, number. It's four characters long. So we need to know how to get out multiple characters. It's not too hard to do. Go back to your shell. If you can't find your shell, just do run Python shell. Let's give ourselves a name or something. A is equal to Bobby Robertson. Most generic name ever. Okay. I can get a slice by using a colon inside the square brackets. So if I print out A from position 0 up to position 4, it's going to print out B-O-B-B. -B -B. That's known as slicing the list. It starts at position 0 and it goes up to but not including, just like when we were using that range statement, position 4. So 0, 1, 2, 3, and it stops. That's why I printed out BOBB. -B. An easier way to look at it is just to take the difference between these two numbers. If you, you know. So if I want to get out the word Robert, I need to figure out the starting position of this and I need to know how long Robert is. Well, Robert is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I don't feel like figuring out what position that is, but I could at least figure that one out and then just add 6 to it. So, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I'm going to start at 6 and then go 6 more characters. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So, A, we're going to start our slice at position 6, and we want to go 6 more. So, 6 plus 6 is 12. And we get Robert. So, that's slicing. So that's slicing, where x is the starting index, y is one past the ending index, y is the ending index, where it stops before reaching trying to word things precisely, but you get the idea. So if I'd done 0 colon 2, it would have gotten B and O. That's position 0 and 1. What is it going to do when I do A 1 colon 4? How long, how many characters is that, is that going to be? It's going to be three characters long, right? That's pretty easy. You just take the four and the one, that's three. And it's starting at position one, which is that, so we can predict. It's going to print OBB. So that's slicing. Why do we need to know that? Because the price is, you know, buried deep in there, and we want to get the 543 or whatever. So we're going to have to use a slice. Wrong one. Guess I'll put okay.
they're telling us that the price starts at 235 and it's four characters long so we're going to do this these two lines of code if it's four characters long starting at 234 that means we want slice 234 to 238 bless you so go back to our code and do price is equal and by the way I guess we could comment these things out we don't need those print statements anymore price is equal to text at 234 and we want eight um, four more characters so 234 plus 4 is 238 It'd be kind of neat if we could just give a starting position and then give the length. Hey, I want 5 after position 100, so I'm going to do 100 comma 5, but that's not the way it works. Let's print that price out. Oh, bless you. And it actually worked, lo and behold. Some versions of the page that I've accessed in the past had the... Uh, price at a different point and so 234 didn't work but good enough the smarter thing to do though would be to find the dollar sign because what if it had been moved right if you're trying to include the dollar sign you change that to 233 but you'd need yep and then it would pull in five that that would be nice to look at if you change that 234 to a 233 and then run it it prints the dollar sign which is great, but why might we not want the dollar sign? Because we're going to convert it to a float. And the dollar sign would cause it, that to be a, a conversion error. So I'm going to change that back to 234. Maybe we can find the alternate version that has the dollar sign moved in a minute. But That's great. It's exactly what I need. You have no idea how much time and money this is going to save me. So I can put any web address into this code? Yeah, feel free to try it out. Don't I need a web browser to view the web pages? Yeah, to see it in its full formatted glory with embedded pictures and colored text and stuff like that. But if all you want to see the raw HTML, the browser is overkill. What does the import line code do? Just like when we imported the turtle library. Brings in some extra code that expands Python to do more than the raw language can do. Those libraries, do they have developers that just add libraries to the base language? Yeah, yeah. I think Python is still masterminded by just one guy, although I'm sure he has a team of people working for him. And so... And then there are other people. You can write your own library if you want. And then you can post it on the net and people can download it or install it. The CEO just got great news. The supplier is so happy about doing the business that they're going to give us a discount site. So instead of using prices.html, they want us to use one called prices-loyalty.html. Let's see if we can make that change. There's no guarantee that this will work because it's a different address, but we'll give it a shot. So instead of... Oh, by the way, if you don't want to fit it all on one line, something you can do is when it's got a parentheses like that or something, you can go ahead and skip to the next line like that. The reason I did that is so that you can see it all on one screen. You don't have to do that. So prices dash loyalty. That's the change we want to make. Supposedly this one's got lower prices. In reality, I'm not sure it does, but it's probably just the same random number. I'm going to need to do a walkabout in a minute and make sure that everybody's been typing along actually has it working okay there we go it printed out bean 
What has happened? Well, the position of it has changed. If we go look at this different web page, it no longer looks like that. It looks like... See, they added something. Special offer! And that was enough to mess it up. So we don't want to hard code positions like that. Instead, we want to look for the dollar sign. And there's a Python function that will search the string for a specific character and return the index value of it. That's what we're going to need. So what's happened is that they've moved it the price is in a different place in the HTML. All we know is that if we look for the dollar sign, the price ought to follow it. So we're going to search the string. For the dollar sign. I'm scrolling past a lot here because they explain this for five pages. That's not bad because they go through a lot of extra stuff, but this is what I want to do. There is a command called dot find where you specify what you want to find and it will tell you. Let's pop open the Python shell and play with that for a moment before we actually implement it. So in idle I'm going to do run Python shell again. I'm going to say a is equal to, you know, lady space gaga. And I want to find that G, so I'm going to look for A dot find G, like that. And it'll say 7. And if I count, the G probably is at position 7. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Six, seven. Notice it skipped the uppercase G because Python is case sensitive. What if there was more than one G? It would find the first one. And we, we'll find ways of getting around that because what if you want the second G? You know. So anyways, A dot find is going to be our friend here. We're going to look for the dollar sign. They're actually suggesting that we look for, you know, arrow dollar sign. I guess that's a little bit more precise. I don't think it's necessary. But if we could follow their code exactly, we would need to do that. Okay, so what we want to do is we need some variables. And they use these long ones, start underscore of underscore price and end underscore of underscore price. I'm just going to use um, start and end. So back to our Starbuzz code. I can't use 234 to 238. I need to find the dollar sign. Where is equal to text.find? Find me the dollar sign. I should check to make sure that there's a dollar sign at all. If you search for something that doesn't exist, let me uh, go back to this. Like Lady Gaga does not have an X in her name yet. So find X. If it doesn't find it at all, it returns a negative one. So if I was a good programmer, what I would do is if where is equal to negative one, I could print an error message or something like that saying no price found. But we're not going to do that. We're not going to overly complicate our program. I don't want to include the dollar sign. So my start position is going to be one past where. So start is equal to where plus one. And then since all of these prices are assumed to be only four spaces long, end is equal to start plus four. So you see what we're doing. We found the position and we're going to start one past that and then we're going to go four more in our slice. Now we need to change that 234 to 238 and make that start colon end like that. I'm going to remove the spaces because that looks a little bit goofy. 
save that and run that puppy. And here is where I'll do walkabout to make sure we've all got it working. Okay, so it found it. And even if we went back to the original web page, if I remove the dash loyalty from the web name, it's still going to find the price because it's just looking for the dollar sign. Pardon me? Yeah, it's searching for the dollar sign. Exactly, right. That is a far better way of dealing with text than just assuming you know the position or useful. So it tells the surprise, big deal. That means that some guy's got to be sitting there hitting F5 or rerunning the program or whatever, you know, over and over and over to see the price. In real life, what would you want it to do? You might want to... Exactly. You might say, I don't want to buy coffee if it's more than $6 or more than $5 or whatever. And so that's the next step of the program. But that's going to involve looping. So we're probably going to use a while loop. Why not a for loop? Because a for loop steps through a series of predefined values, like the letters of your name or that list of numbers. So for loop is not good for when it's sitting there waiting for some random conditions. Instead, it's for very specified values that it knows in advance. Well, that was quick. We're back to saving money. Now, there was one more thing. Customers are never satisfied. They will always try to get you to make more changes to your code. And that's good if they're paying you for every change. Let's add a loop to the program that stops when the price of coffee is right. So what they're going to do is they're going to set the price variable super high. And then they're going to have while price is greater than whatever their target price is. So why did they set it super high? So it'll go into the while loop to begin with. If they set this equal to zero, the price wouldn't be greater than 474 and it'd just fall through and it would say buy without even checking it. So we're going to add two lines of code here. We're going to add this line of code here, or at least move it, do something, and then we're going to do some tabbing. So let's go do that. Uh, sorry about that. I have these little Bluetooth trackers on my keys and wallet because I'm always losing them. But when I sit on them the wrong way, they yell at the iPad. Okay. So let's do that. Go back to our. I'm going to close this list one because I keep hitting it by accident. Okay. Now apparently they put the entire thing inside the, inside the while loop. I'm going to type this. Don't do this. But while price is too high. Like I said, don't type this. This is going to be kind of a rhetorical question. What would be wrong with doing it like that? The print is, it's saying the print is part of the loop. Okay, so let's move that there. There's still conceptually something wrong with that, and that's a good answer. Yeah, I read it in once, and then it's sitting there waiting for it to change. It's not going to change. So we're going to have to put the while loop above this stuff. Now let's go ahead and code it a little bit more like, oops, like the book has it. Price is equal to nine, whatever, some absurdly high value. While the price is greater than our target price, they have 474. I don't know if it ever gets that low. I'm going to change mine to 501. Colon. Now, all of this stuff needs to be indented. You could do it one at a time, or you can highlight the whole shebang and hit the tab key, or highlight the whole shebang and then click format 
indent region. That's what I do rather than hitting tab on every line. Okay, this program is getting long, so I'm going to remove these two extraneous print statements. And that while. That while certainly is not part of it. Sorry. Okay, there we go. Yes, sir. This is an integer, but it's okay. It'll compare ints to floats. You're right. To make it look more legit, and that's the way they did it in their program, you could do that. But it's not strictly necessary. I like it. I like that suggestion. I'm going to go with it. The question was, why are we setting it to an int when our price is a float? And the answer to that is that if you're doing a greater than, those kind of comparisons can be done. Don't we need to convert the price to a float at the end? You're right. It's going to blow up. It's going to be a string. Let's run it, and you will see that because we're trying to compare a string to that. You're not going to work. It says unorderable type. It gives a funky error message, but at least it gives us a line number. Line number five. And it's saying that we're trying to compare a string to a float, so that is not good. So here's a change, another change we need to make. Convert that to a float. Price is equal to float price. And I'm going to flag this with a whole bunch of comments so that it's easy to see what I changed. This is the stuff that I've just added. That line, that line, and one at the very end that's unindented, so it's outside of the loop, just like you said, that says print by now. Oh, and if we were good programmers, we would have documented this by putting our name and our date and a description of what the program does. I'll do that in a minute. All right, it's running. It finally hit it, and it says buy now. There is still a problem with this code. Conceptually, it works. Yours may not work yet if you have typos, but this works. But there's a problem. We have, you know, 24 students in the class. We run it. We have 24 people hitting that website as fast as Python will let it. Now, modern web servers don't care if you have 24 people doing things at the same time, but um, really, you don't want your program to slam the website as fast as possible. What if this program, this website, really did only change its price once every five minutes? You can make do with checking every one minute rather than checking 10 times a second. If you do that checking 10 times a second kind of thing, then uh, somebody may notice the extra traffic and decide to block your account from uh, you know, accessing your page or something like that. So test drive, yeah. Strings and numbers are different. We already know this. For the guessing game, we had to turn the guess into an integer. To turn our price, we use the float command. I should say keyword rather than command. So we ran our program. We gave it to the CEO. He was happy until he got this letter. The Department of Webland Security. From address 37, you don't need to know where we are, but we know where you are. A, to whom it may concern. We've recently investigated the apparent distributed denial of service attack. What is a denial of service attack? Um, that's when you have multiple or a whole bunch of machines out on the internet sending data to or requesting data from the same server. And you know, nowadays there are these botnets where you can have thousands upon thousands of machines. You know, and they have all got a virus installed on them so that they can all be under control of the same guy. You know. In, China or you know, 
Russia or whatever. And uh, for whatever nefarious purposes, they want them all to access the same server. And if they do it in the right fashion, if they send an update to the same thing, they can crash it. And that's a real world problem, even though, you know, this is a silly example of it. We are watching you, bud. Consider yourself on notice. All right. That sounds weird. What happened? We've overloaded the Beans RS server because it was running as fast as possible. We need to delay the requests so that we're only doing it once a minute or whatever, and that's too boring for our classroom, but we're going to at least slow it down to like once every five seconds. So we have a library that's making internet requests, but we need another library for bringing in some clock functions so that we can wait a while. There's a time library. It has various functions built in. Time.clock will return the current time in seconds. Time.daylight returns a zero if we are not in daylight savings time. It returns a one if we are, and so on. GM time tells us the current time in Greenwich Meridian time. Local time tells us the current time affected by our time zone. Sleep, that's the one we want. We're going to do a time.sleep. Don't do anything for a specified number of seconds. That's what we want. I don't see that that has the change in it, so we're going to keep going. Import time. We're going to need this one, import time, and then we're going to add this line, time.sleep. So under import URL request, add the line import time. I wish I could do that just at random. I need more time, so I'm going to import it. And then as either the first or the last statement, yeah, let's do it as the first. The first statement inside the while loop, add time.sleep. He's got 900. I don't want to wait 900 seconds. So I'm going to change that to just 5. 100 to be 100 seconds, but I still don't feel like waiting that long. In real life, you don't want to hit the internet as often as possible, but to watch this stuff happen in class, I do. So here, import time. I just added that line. And here, under that while, I'm going to do time dot, did it, was it wait or sleep? Time dot sleep. Sleep for five seconds. See if I'd made it a hundred. <laughs> We'd wait a long time. Okay. So eventually it's going to hit it when the price drops below five. Me being in favor of instant gratification, I'm going to lower it to two seconds. They'll find it eventually. You could write a different program that would run this for like an hour and then print out the lowest price that was ever reached and the highest so that we can kind of get a, a, a feeling for the range of negative values that it's generating. Okay, since it's never finding it, I'm going to raise my limit. Are you using the, old Are you using the loyalty one? Yeah. loyalty has a lower price. Oh, I forgot to change it to loyalty, or I unchanged it. I need to make that back. Okay, cool. So prices dash loyalty, I undid my prior change. Yeah, right away, okay. But at least I proved it worked. Okay, I'm gonna lower the price then. While the price is greater than 501, I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna see if it ever gets to four dollars or less.
Why do I care? I'm going to stop that. We have seen that the program works. I would like for it to loop for you, so do lower that five to something, like at least four and a half dollars, so that it runs for a little while and then and then stops. Well, it got to 402. I bet four is its limit. So, just to give a realistic demonstration, I'm going to bump this desired price. Now, again, this is kind of cheesy. We have this price hard coded into the program right there. That limit. It ought to be a variable. And we ought to ask the user, what is your target price? You know, target equals input parentheses. What is your target price? That kind of thing. Okay. I do not recall if the text takes this exercise any further. Let's go look. Orders restored. Okay, so what have we learned? Strings are sequences of individual characters, lists. Individual string characters, you reference them by their index. They are offsets that start from zero. The first character in any string is at position zero. I was calling them functions, but in reality, if you have a function that's attached to another variable like that, that's actually called a method. A method is a function that's attached to a variable, and it takes a special kind of programming in order to create variables that have functions attached. And then those are put into libraries so that you can import them and use them. And if we went far enough we could write our own. These are what are known as classes. Classes are variables that have methods attached to them, but that's more for the next class, for the scripting class. Or if you go on and take Java or C++, you'll write classes. Continuing on our review. Programming libraries provide a collection of, rela of related pre-built code and functions. You can write your own libraries too. As well as having a value, data in variables also have a data type. Yeah, we know that. Number is a data type. No, it's not. Int is and float is. Strings are a data type. You can access a specific character using the brace, or you can get a slice, a subset. Some languages call it a substring. If you want to find a specific value in that list, you could use dot .find. There are other methods attached to it, too. Like if you want to make everything uppercase, you use dot .upper or dot .lower to make everything lowercase. We know what greater than sign means. We know how to get to the Internet, what library to request. And we know what library to request in order to use the sleep command or to print out the time or stuff like that. Woohoo! We are done with that chapter. All right, guys, let's take a little break for drink acquisition, bathroom breaks, whatever. I'll wander around and make sure that nobody had syntax errors. So let's hook back up at 1.30. All right, guys, when we talked about binary and hex, stuff like that, did the worksheet you fill out, was it this one with lots of red text and stuff formatted in tables and things like that? Okay. So I need to post this as homework for you all. Because since the stuff's going to be on the exam, it's worth letting y'all see it one more time. Kind of like that, but it didn't have red text. Okay. All right. So I'll upload this one. Sadly, this one has several of the answers already filled in. How does that <laughs> All right. So anyways, I'll modify this and I'll upload it. It'll be one of our homework assignments.
Okay, so I'm going to go back to the... Go back to the text, the other text that we've been stepping through. Functions. A function is a chunk of code that you can invoke with a single name. And since turtles are so fun, let's make our first sample function. Nah. Let's not do that. Name. Date. June 21. Sample functions. That's what we're going to do. So let's write a function that says, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy dead birthday to you. Maybe it'll say it three times. I'm going to call it B-Day. The way you define a function is with the DEF keyword. DEF stands for define. Then you give the function a name, and then you give it parentheses. You don't have to put a space between the parentheses. And then you put some code. I'm going to use a for loop to print out happy birthday 10 times in a row. For x in range 10, colon, print happy birthday. Then I'm going to put a return statement. I'm not going to indent the return statement, the return statement, or else it would return after printing only once. And when I say not indent, I mean not inside the for loop. Okay, now down here in our main code, you know, the start part of a flowchart, I can call bday like that. Then I can print, that was fun. And let's say I'm greedy and I want more birthday greetings, so I call bday again. Oops, sorry. Let's call this one Funks1. F-U-N-C-S-1 dot P-Y. Again, the name doesn't really matter. So it prints happy birthday 10 times. It says that was fun, and then it prints happy birthday 10 more times. So this is showing two ways of avoiding duplicate code. I could have just copy and pasted that line that said print happy birthday, you know, 10 times. And then I could have printed out that was fun. And then I could have, you know, copied that block of 10 print statements and pasted it again. But that's really nasty. What if you had to change this to say happy birthday in Spanish? Here we only have to change it in one place. What if we wanted it to print 20 times rather than 10? Well, rather than copying those 10 statements and pasting them again and stuff like that, you can see that if you ignore this part, being able to call that stuff, if you call this your main program, this is far shorter than it would be if we didn't have loops and if we didn't have functions. So function is a named block of code. This is the name of the block. We've seen a lot where we pass arguments into functions. Is there any modification to this function where we might want to be able to pass an argument in and have it change the, the, the behavior of the function? You know, if I wanted something to say happy birthday, is there anything that would be useful there? There are no wrong answers. Except for deafening silence. <laughs> yeah, some kind of text message that you could add to it. Or a name. If you want to print out somebody's name. Or if you want to specify how many times it wants to run. Let's do that one because that's the easiest. So I'm going to put a 10 here. And a five here, because I wanted to say ten happy birthdays, and then I wanted to say five happy birthdays. And guess what? That breaks the program. Won't that, won't say 100 happy 
Well, it's going to break the program, and we're going to fix it so it wouldn't say 100. Okay. The problem is, is that we modified it by to pass in an argument, but it doesn't accept an argument. You know, we put something there, but there's no variable being filled in here. So in our notes, let me copy how we had it before I broke it. That start comment is not necessary for the code. It's just to indicate if we were going to flow chart it, where that would go. So we need to pass this 10 into the function. So we're going to fill in a variable. And the technical name for a variable that accepts an argument is a parameter. I want to say it 10 times. So put the word times there. And I just chose that variable name, it, you know, arbitrarily. Could have called it Fred. And I'm going to take, take that 10, that hard-coded value, and change it to the variable, to the parameter. So now instead of saying for x in range 10, it's going to say for x in range times, and we are setting times equal to 10. So it'll repeat itself 10 times. And then later on, it'll repeat itself five times. All right. Next, it'd be cool if we could pass in a name. Sally's going to get 10 birthday messages. Jill only gets five. Again, this breaks the code. Why? Because the function is defined to accept one argument, but now we're passing in two arguments. So we need a second variable, a second parameter. Name seems like a natural fit to me. So I'm going to tack on comma name there. So this is our parameter, our variable that contains the name. Let's change this message a little bit. So it says, happy birthday, comma, name. Or I'm going to take that comma out, but that way it says, happy birthday, space, no, I don't even need to space then. Happy birthday, comma, followed by the name. We're losing our exclamation mark. We're not quite as excited about saying happy birthday anymore, but that's okay. Happy birthday, Sally. Happy birthday, Jill. So that's what's cool about writing functions. We are encapsulating a lot of functionality just by making it so that we can change the way it works based on these arguments, based on these parameters that get filled in. We could ask the user, what is your name? And we could ask the user, what is your age? And we could call that function. And if they're 75, it'd print out happy birthday 75. Don't need the head first book anymore. All righty. So you can name your function anything you want, except it can't be a Python keyword and it has to follow the other naming conventions, like you can't start with a number or have a space in it. But names are just names. I could call this Fred. That's a stupid name. Why would I call it Fred? But I could. And as long as I called it Fred down here and Fred down here, it would still work. I'm going to undo that change. So the names are, are for you to use. It's useful if you pick good names. That way, when you're looking at it later, it makes sense. So a function consists of a header line that begins with the DEF keyword and ends in a colon. Let's make some notes here. A function is a block of code with a name. Example shown above.
a function consists of one, a header line, hate that word header, a definition line, DEF, that gives, that defines the name of the function and any parameters it has, any arguments it accepts. I'm going to switch to the word parameters. I've been calling them arguments. You call them arguments when you're invoking the function. So when we told the turtle to go forward 100 pixels, that 100 is an argument. But inside the function itself, the name for the variable that gets filled in there is called a parameter. Kind of a subtle distinguish, um, distinction. Sometimes I will slip up when I'm up here, I'm going to say, okay, it accepts three parameters. Here is parameters, three, common name, common, whatever. They're not interchangeable, but I, they're easily confused, and I'm not going to be real rigorous on it, and I'm not going to yell at you if you get them wrong, and I'm not going to ask you the difference between those terms on an exam. But you will hear them over and over. So the DEF gives the name of the function and any parameters it accepts. So that's part of the function, but a function that's just a DEF is pretty useless. It has to have a body of code. A function consists of a body of code, which is one or more lines of code. Do I see a hand being raised? I'm not. I guess not. So here's this guy, this author's function. They write a function called draw square, and it's a turtle program where they say draw square, they pass in a name of a turtle, and they pass in a number of pixels. We're going to modify our program a little bit so it doesn't exactly do that, but it's going to be very similar. I like to define the turtle before the functions so I don't have to pass it in every time. And that's not the best style of programming, but it makes using it a little bit easier. So let's go over here and add on to our birthday program. import turtle I guess making it the screen was so fun that we may want to do that too okay I'm just gonna call my turtle T this time rather than Leo it's easier to type a T so T is equal to lowercase turtle dot uppercase turtle and then our window is equal to lowercase turtle dot screen. Yes. Let's confirm that. Yes. Apparently this, no, I'm not going to even go there. I'm not sure, I haven't figured out the logic for when the turtle library wants you to capitalize something and when not, because the commands forward and back and left and right weren't capitalized, but these are. Okay, let's set the background color of the turtle of the screen, that is. So we're going to type BG color. BG color, I want a blue screen. And let's set the color of the turtle, T dot color, white. And then just to make sure the darn thing works, we're going to go T dot forward 100 pixels. screen with a white turtle. Okay, I'm going to get rid of that t.forward for now, but we're going to define a function called square that draws a square. So def square, and let's define a parameter. Why is square border? Because it's a function name. You're right. Okay, we're going to rename our function. DEF draws... Oh, wait. Nope, 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 nope. That is actually true. Just like um, up here, B-Day. 
the functions we define get colored blue. Okay, so I'm going to change it back to square because it's shorter. DEF square, it, let's call our parameter size. Size is going to be the length of each line of our square. And the easiest way to draw four lines might be to use a for loop because we know it's going to be four. So for x in range four, we have four sides. T dot forward, that many pixels. And then let's turn, I don't know, you want to go left or right? I'm going to go left. 90. And then I'm going to stick a return statement there. And it's not going to be indented under the for loop because if it was, it would only draw one line, not all four sides. All right, let's test it out. I'm going to draw a square that's 10 pixels long, one that's 20 pixels long, one that's 30 pixels long. Yay, neato. I like it. So it's pretty neat to be able to draw a square, something that actually takes, you know, a considerable chunk of code, only three lines, but still, and then invoke it just with a single statement like that, square, square, square. Let's implement a command that will move the turtle without drawing a line to somewhere else. And let's just call it, let's see if go to is a legal word. Might not be. Might be one of the reserved words. So above those calls to the square function, def go to, and it's going to accept two arguments. It needs two parameters, x comma y. The first thing it needs to do is lift the pin because it's moving. So t dot Is it just pin up with no underscores? I think after years I would have this memorized. Yep, well, I really don't think it's capitalized that way. Could be wrong. We'll find out. T dot pin up. I'm just going to compile, compile this and run it to make sure that it works before I go any further. Go to 100 comma 100. I'm just tacking this on to test this function before I do anything else. Okay, okay, good. Don't have to capitalize that U and pin up. Okay, so lift the pin. And then we need to do T dot set X, set the X position to the parameter x, t dot set y to the y position, and then t dot pin down. Now we ought to be able to draw our squares in different places. So before I draw my first square, I'm going to go to 100 comma 100. So I just added that line. Before I draw my next square, I'm going to go to negative 100, comma 100. And before the third one, I'm going to make it go to 100, comma negative 100.
You may have noticed that I was sloppy and didn't put a return on this one, but I did here. The return statement, what it does, is it returns a value that could be used by your program. Like that one we used, I'm just going to scroll down here and type in something. Well, I guess I could do it in the notes. You know, when we had uh, S or N is equal to, you know, and then we gave it a name. And then we typed X is equal to, or now, let's give it an example almost exactly like the coffee was. Price, comma, dollar sign, 3.45. And then we did x is equal to n dot find, and we told it to find the dollar sign. This find function had to return a value that could then be copied into x. And it does that with the return statement. Return is what returns <laughs> the value out of the find function. Now, I'm not going to rewrite the find function. But let's give ourselves another example. I hate to clutter up this beautiful turtle code with something not germane but let's go for it anyways let's define a new function that's going to calculate the area of a circle because that's the most important thing in the universe we're going to call it cal um, area circ and it takes a radius as an argument as a parameter we could just shorten that to R to make things easier to type. So, area circ, R colon. Now, the area of a circle is defined as pi R squared. So, 3.14159 times R times R, or R star star 2. But then return that area. That way, if we wanted to know the area of a circle of radius 10, we could do this. Print area of radius 10 is, comma, area circ. I didn't store that in a variable first. Like that. Or you could do y is equal to the area of a circle of radius 100. That kind of thing. That's what the return keyword does is we calculate some value inside the function and we want to pass it back into our main code the unindented code so we use that now if you leave that return keyword off Python behind the scenes adds it and the exact syntax of what they add is this don't type this but return none although none may be capitalized yeah, like that. That's what it does behind the scenes, is it inserts that. But we can leave off the word return if we are not returning a variable back out. So this square function doesn't strictly need a return statement. Go to doesn't strictly need a return statement. I'll show you in a minute why I've been putting the return statements there, but the code works just as well without it. It is generally bad programming to mix functions and your main code. What I ought to do is cut that and move it up to the top of the program. For demonstration purposes, it's fine, but really you want to put all your functions up at the top of the program. If you have to put a few setup things above your program, above your functions just to get things going, like, you know, to create the turtle and to create the screen, it's okay to have a few lines of code before your functions are defined, but you shouldn't have, you know, pages of code and then your first function and then more pages of code and then your sef second function and so on. They ought to be pretty close to the top of the program and if I hadn't have thrown this junk in up here at the top, they, you know, these functions would have been. Very, very good question. The question is, do the functions have to be defined in such a way? Is order important? And the answer to that is sometimes, and the more specific answer is that in this class, they, it is very important. Yes? Um, it says that my area is not defined to give me a syntax error. Let me come look. Oh, 
why did I type area star 3.14159? If you did the same thing I did, then that should be area equals. I guess I never actually even ran it. I apologize, guys. You never, uh, you need to make this change. You need, if you typed in a star there, change that to an equal sign and it should actually work. I say that, let's run it and make sure. Okay, good deal. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna take the idea of this and put it into a new file because we're gonna change this to a homework assignment. So there's a little bit of cutting and pasting I would like to do, and I will also put this in the homework assignment itself. But this go to function is so useful. Go ahead and grab that. Copy it. Start a new one and call this one face. This is going to be called face.py. And this is going to be the other part of the homework assignment. So again, I'm going to do the import turtle stuff, and I'm not going to bother changing the color of the background and stuff like that, so that it's going to be a little bit shorter. But I do want that go-to. But above it, I need to import turtle. And then I need to make my turtle. T is equal to lowercase, T-U-R-T-L-E, dot uppercase turtle, parentheses, that's enough. So here's my goal. I'm going to type some stuff down here at the bottom that you don't necessarily need to type yet. But this is my goal. Thinking out, li out loud, I want to be able to draw a circle this easily. I want to be able to say, I want you to draw a circle at negative 200 comma negative 200. I want it to be a circle of radius 10. And I want it to be red. It'd be cool if I had a function that did all that. So we're going to do that. It shan't take too long, actually. So... Since that's my goal, since that's my target to get that to work, I think I will leave that there. I told you not to type it, but if you want to, go ahead. Did I not name this thing? Oh, I just put the name in comments. Face.py. So here I go. What is the keyword that you always use when defining a function? Three letters. Bigger and deffer. D E F. And then draw a circle. How many parameters is this thing going to need? Four. It needs four. Let's pick some good names for the parameters. The first two are the X and the Y coordinates. X and Y. How about that? The third one is the radius. We could just go with R or we could put the whole word radius. And the fourth one's the color. If we wanted to make it so that you could do a different fill color than an outside color, then well, we could make we could make that change, but I'm not going to bother. And then a colon. The first thing we need to do is we need to go to that specific position on the screen. Then we need to call the circle command. And the last thing I'm going to do is I'm always going to reset the heading of the circle so it's pointing at the same direction. The reason why I, I do that is because the way the circle is drawn depends upon which way the pin is going. I forget if it always goes to the left or to the right, but I think it's to the left. And so if the circle, if the uh, cursor is going up, then it draws a circle like that, like a Q. And if it, the line was going down, then it draws it like that, you know, like a G. So I want it to be consistent. So there's a set heading. 
command that I'm also going to use. But firstly, let's, yeah, so t dot set heading zero, just so it's always going the same direction. And then go to position x comma y. Let's set the color, t dot color, parentheses, and then our color variable. And let's draw our circle. T dot circle of the specified radius. I didn't put a return statement on that go to, but go ahead and add one. It's not strictly necessary, but when we draw the flow chart, putting that return at the bottom of that function is necessary, so I'm just trying to get in the habit. The only drawback is, is it fills up, you know, more lines of code. I wonder if that's enough. I wonder if with this draw circle command I put down here at the bottom, if it'll actually work. Yeah, drew a circle way down there in the corner. Awesome possum. Can we hide the turtle? Is there a T dot hide? T dot hide. I'm adding a T dot hide, but I'm going to ask, I'm going to run it to make sure it works before I have to get on to do it. No. Uh, do you, whatever that command we're using, put a string get rid of That will, yeah, that'll erase the whole thing, not just the turtle. Well, use it first, then you get rid of the turtle, and then it draws the circle. Let's try it. So, oh, but I would have to create the one. I, I know there's a command. That I, you may be right, but I'm going to find the way of doing it on a uh, individual basis. So you can hide it and show it and hide it and show it. Oh, it's the whole word hide turtle. Excuse me. Or it's abbreviation HT. Let's do that. So here I'm going to make this T dot HT parentheses, which stands for hide turtle. Or if you want to spell out hide turtle instead, that's fine. This is just to make it slightly prettier. There. It drew a circle and we don't see the line. If you don't want to do that, take that line back out. Okay, that is enough for us to set up the homework assignment. We are going to flowchart this because we need to know how to flowchart functions. So I do want to make sure that everybody who got to end, all of this code from here to here is going to be pasted into the homework assignment.